This is Sheldon Brown, the chief engineer for the Tacoma, and we're going to ask him some technical questions about how the, the strategy for this truck came together. So what we put together here today are, I'll say, some Frankenstein uh, uh, rolling chassis. They came uh, off of our, our parts bin in Ann Arbor. Some of these trucks have been uh, sitting out in our in our uh, crash yard for quite a while. But what we wanted to demonstrate today is really uh, the differences in, in the frame architecture from the previous generation to the new TNGF platform. Uh, and again, the new TNGF platform is something that we've cascaded across all of our trucks here, our body on frame in North America, starting with uh, Tundra, and then of course Sequoia, now Tacoma, uh, and the, uh, the Land Cruise that we just recently announced coming will be built off of the same structure as well. Looking back to the, uh, the old uh, or the previous generation, the current uh, model Tacoma, uh, obviously you can see that we have our, our tri-frame section here boxed, we have the partial C channel here, and then we go into a full open C in the rear. Um, this is really good for keeping a lightweight frame. It gives you some good twist performance, but um, also um, the, the downside of that is you get some of the flex and especially some of the harmonics when you start to get into to vehicle, uh, vehicle ride and handling performance. So we wanted to make sure that we in, uh, increase the rigidity, uh, the overall strength of the new platform, um, but we wanted to do it in a way um, that was, uh, again, common to the uh, flexible among the different needs of the different vehicles on this platform. So a very different uh, strength requirement, for example, for full size than for the midsize truck. Um, and the way we're able to accomplish that, first and foremost, is we have a fully boxed uh, ladder frame, right? So we talk about the box here, and then of course, the cross members that go across. Um, specific to this frame then, uh, we wanted to keep the silhouette roughly, or the same, um, I shouldn't say roughly, <laughs> we want to keep the silhouette the same uh, between all of the trucks and then really just extend uh, the frame based on the differences in the wheelbase, for example, between uh, the SUV, the full-size pickup, and, and the compact truck. Um, right, so this, this box frame construction, which is not open, this gives us more rigidity it does. than the previous generation, but you say it's still, a, is it about the same weight? Uh, yeah, so when we think about the total vehicle uh, architecture, uh, the frame, just the frame in and of itself, uh, is is slightly heavier, but if we think about the frame with the suspension and, and chassis components, uh, we're pretty close to being on par. Uh, and the way we're able to do that is we're able to actually change uh, the thickness in various areas. Uh, we can apply both gauge up or thickness up of the frame channel, or we can apply uh, higher strength steels in areas where we need additional or we have higher stress or we need uh, additional strength. And the way we're able to do that is what we talked about in the walk around, we called it Dejima. Dejima is the Japanese word for islands, so we're calling them islands of strength. <laughs> Effectively what we're doing is we're, we're, we're basically laser blanking and tailor welding uh, a blank together. And you can see here uh, where we have a, an idea where we can keep a lower gauge, uh, potentially even a lower uh, metal strength here. Um, where we need that structure uh, here, we're able to then put in a, a greater gauge and a, actually a higher strength steel in this area, weld those two together, we then form them, and then of course they're put together in a, a, a two C channels come together and then we weld along the top. The great thing about that is it allows us to have the, the material and the, and the strength in the areas that we need it, but we don't have to increase the general gauge section. The only other way to do that then, uh, if we didn't do that, we'd have to put some sort of gussets uh, or additional component parts welded on the inside of this channel to strengthen this particular area. And what we, uh, while that certainly is something that can be done, um, uh, we have additional uh, concerns and, and this helps with our, our corrosion or our, I should say our anti-corrosion performance um, because we get rid of those heat affected zones on the inside where we have uh, welds and areas for that water can catch and rest. Um, we, we get rid of that completely because we have a nice smooth wall now. All that water can drain right out and move out. So it's really great for not only uh, the strength and uh, the durability of the frame but also for the long term uh, corrosion reliability on the frame. A lot of people have been in the forums and comments talking about the lack of the V6. So now we sure. have a turbocharged 2.4 engine mm -hmm. and that's gonna make more heat than before. So what is Toyota's cooling strategy for this? Thank you for bringing that up. I know it's an important thing for our customers. And the first thing I just wanna say is that we are definitely taking these motors, taking these engines and putting them through uh, the same level of torture testing that we would have done on any motor that we bring uh, to market. Um, and specifically, you mentioned the heat, and I think that's an important piece. Uh, this is a bit of a Frankenstein here. We don't actually have the cool pack here, but what's important is on the water and the, and the water inlet. Um, basically, we're using a pump and a water inlet that would be normally spec for our V8 motor, about three inches in diameter. Uh, and really that's to make sure that we have the flow, making sure the water is pushing through the, the engine cooling jacket, uh, making sure that we keep those temperatures in check so that we can uh, you know, ensure the longevity of, of these motors. And it's important to note that these, uh, you know, especially on the truck motors, may be different than what we do in PASCAR, 
recognizing duty cycles are different, recognizing the fact that we're going to be doing things like towing, etc. Um, we also understand that we run all these motors to what we consider our commercial grade, uh, and, and especially the componentry uh, such as the turbo. Uh, and the reason we do that is to make sure that uh, we uh, test these motors under even more uh, extreme circumstances, much larger duty cycles uh, to make sure that when we go out to the truck customer, uh, we're providing a, a powertrain that's suitable for their needs. So with the different grades, as we move from on-road to off-road, you've got different types of suspension. Can you kind of explain how as we move up to more off-road, you are altering the suspension and making, you know, using different components? Absolutely, surely can. So again, we have a, a slightly abnormal uh, rolling chassis here. What we did in the front is we've actually demonstrated what the, what the TRD Pro suspension looks like. In the back, we have the, uh, the TRD off-road package suspension. Just to give you a sense of, of what we are doing here, uh, obviously you can see there's some unique features. Um, we get the uh, forged aluminum upper control arm, obviously the Fox QS3 uh, switchable uh, system here uh, uh, for, the, for the Pro. Um, but as we think about the different, I'll say, driving scenarios, when we're on road, for example, in the Sport, we're using a twin tube absorber, uh, a spring that's gonna have a different rate based, uh, that's gonna be more, uh, I'll say, dynamically tuned towards on-road performance because what we wanted to do with these trucks is to make sure that we are tuning them to that customer expectation. So a TRD Sport is gonna be a performance based, it's gonna be tuned uh, with both the, the, the wheel and tire uh, as well as the, the, um, the, the coils and the absorbers to give you a better on-road perf on performance. We, we turned uh, to a monotube style uh, when we go uh, to the off-road, which you can see back here. Um, this one's actually our Bilstein monotube with a reservoir, uh, piggyback reservoir. Um, I think that's uh, some technology that we've really brought to uh, make sure that the overall performance uh, off-road, especially when you're heating those shocks up, we have the capacity to keep them cool and make sure that, that you don't get any shock fade. Uh, another really cool part about this, of course, is this features the, the, the Bilstein, uh, or the Bilstein um, uh, ta uh, end, end stop control. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got a cutaway of that we can show you here, um, but that's really great because we can keep a very good uh, linear performance through the on-road area and then we get additional uh, compression uh, and, and damping to, to stop you in those high, and when you're off-road you get those high energy uh, to slow the, the suspension down before we get you into the bump stops. And so you can see back here, of course, in, in the reservoir, um, and then of course uh, here what we're showing, and this is, this is really featuring that end-stop control, um, and that is this, uh, basically we've got our our valve code or a valve in here that's allowing the, in the of course in this case there would be oil in here uh, it would be passing through and giving that absorption and then when we get up to the either the topping or the bottoming um, we start to pick up the second uh, the second sort of valve which can then change the the compression ratio so basically when you're hitting the stop you're absorbing some of the energy so it's not transferring that's quite exactly so right. quickly to the body you got it exactly so we get this high energy we want to keep this nice and, and you know good for compliance on road but then when we start to get that high energy we start to really increase that uh, that absorption and then stop you from getting into those stops really hard